Hello everyone, this is Shannon from That's So Poe, and today I'm doing week 32 of my 2021 reads. This week I read four books and DNF'd four books, which is a high ratio even for me, so we'll go ahead and talk about those. Uh, Timestamps and content warnings are in the description box below. The first book that I finished this week was The Jasmine Throne by Tasha Suri. This is a new first book in an epic fantasy, I believe, trilogy, and I was so in love with this. This was one of my most anticipated releases this year. I really, really love Tasha Suri's other works. Um, I have a review, which I will link below, for her Books of Amha series, which is her previous series, but this one is so, so good. It is very much epic fantasy and it's got lots of different perspectives, lots of um, intricacies in terms of the world building and the magic and the politics. Very, very much my style. Um, it also is a little bit of a darker story, uh, lots of very difficult choices, morally great characters, those sorts of things, but it has a lot of heart as well. So, so much of the story is about people's loyalties and their love for their family and um, people that they are romantically interested in, all of these sorts of things. Um, the main characters in this are Priya and Malini. Priya is a maidservant and Malini is an exiled princess and we get their perspectives but we also get the perspectives of many other people. Malini's brother is the new emperor and he's kind of a religious zealot um, causing quite a bit of issues in the empire and there's lots of rebellions being planned, those sorts of things. So really great um, political intrigue in this and also the magic system is very very interesting one of the main magic systems we get introduced to although there are multiple in here uh, is to do with like earth elemental magic so it is just fascinating I absolutely loved this and I do have a standalone review coming up later this week I gave it five out of five stars and I think that if you like that kind of grand epic fantasy that's maybe a little bit slower moving and has really intricate um, world building and characters, this is so worth picking up. Next, I read The Princess Trap by Talia Hibbert. This is a contemporary romance that has the whole trope of um, a normal everyday woman who falls in love with a guy that turns out to be a prince and has to go back to his, you know, small Scandinavian country um, to fulfill her princess duties. Uh, and this is a lot of fun. I really like how Talia Hibbert takes that trope, but does her own thing with it. Um, so in this, we have kind of this uh, engagement of convenience because the main characters are caught in a compromising situation um, and because of the whole issues of the hero being a prince they need to smooth things over by having a year-long engagement to make it seem like oh it's okay um, and they go back to you know his country but I love this because it has a lot more depth to it in terms of taking a look at very toxic and abusive family relationships and really characters working through a lot of that. So this does have some heavier content in it. Again, there's content warnings in the description box below if you want to see what exactly is in there. There's also a little bit of uh, like dominance play in this. It's very light, but I just really thoroughly enjoyed this book. I was having kind of one of those days where you just need a little bit of escapism and this book fit the bill so perfectly. I really enjoyed the characters, lots of great steamy scenes, and just that uh, depth of working through very traumatic pasts was something that really rounded out this book really nicely. So I thoroughly enjoyed it and I gave it five out of five stars. Next, I read Through the Woods by Emily Carroll. This is a collection of graphic short stories that are sort of ghost stories or horror stories. This is a very creepy set of stories, but I really liked it. The atmosphere was just so intense and the storytelling was so well done. And more than anything else, the graphic work is amazing. It is so beautifully illustrated. I loved the colors that were used. I loved the way that the panels were set out. They were done in a really good way that kind of um, made you feel that tension and creepiness and atmosphere. And I just loved the way that all of it was drawn, although it does get a little bit graphic, a little bit gruesome in some of the stories at certain parts, but even 
so it was just such a fantastic collection that I still gave it four and a half out of five stars. Then I read Disfigured by Amanda LaDuke, and this I buddy read with Angela at Literature Science Alliance, who I will link below. Uh, I was so glad to buddy read this with Angela because she is, if you're interested at all in SFF, just somebody who not only reads a ton of genre fiction, but is really reflective about what she reads and thinks carefully about the representation in it. And so both of us were talking about how we wanted to read more about disability representation in kind of, you know, SFF and genre fiction, because I think it's really important to understand and be able to identify when there are ableist tropes. And so we decided to pick this up together. Uh, Amanda LaDuc, the author, is somebody with cerebral palsy, and this book is basically a, a mini memoir slash manifesto about um, the way that disability is represented in fairy tales. And she really focuses on fairy tales because that's one of those areas where disability is often present in some of the characters, often in very negative ways. And because fairy tales are such a part of the way that we socialize kids, it can be just really reinforcing a lot of those um, stereotypes and beliefs about disability, um, especially really negative ones. So I think that this does a really great job of talking about how important the narratives we have about uh, disability are, and especially how impactful fairy tales are in reinforcing that narrative in our society and kind of framing the way that we think about disability and how important it is that we change some of those representations. The first couple of chapters of this especially do a great job of explaining the different models of disability, the way that people kind of think about it. So the older medical model, which basically said, oh, disability is something wrong with your body and you need to fix it, versus the social model, which is a much more modern one, which says, hey, actually, lots of people have different bodies. The issue is when society doesn't accommodate them. And it talks about all sorts of other things, too. So I think this is a really good introduction um, to the idea of how to think about disability and how it is used in genre fiction. Um, it does, though, as the book goes on, get a bit repetitive um, and a bit kind of all over the place. There's just a lot of repetition, even repetition of quotes. Um, and sometimes within the chapters, I had a hard time seeing what was the real point of each chapter. Uh, she does a lot of summarization of different fairy tales. And so each chapter, she'll kind of focus on a couple of different ones. But I still had a hard time following the structure and I didn't really like how wordy it was and how repetitive it was. I felt like this book could have been about half as long, maybe even a third as long, and it would have been a really, really solid read. But even so, there were quite a good uh, quite a few good things in this, and if you're new to disability representation, I think this could be a very good introduction. For me, I gave this three out of five stars, and um, if anybody is really a big sci-fi or fantasy reader and wants to know more about disability rep, I actually would really recommend there are two special issues of Uncanny Magazine, one which is Disabled People Destroy Science Fiction. I do have a review for that, so I will link it below, and the other is Disabled People Destroy uh, fantasy. And both of those have a collection of short stories written by disabled people, which talk about um, kind of like they kind of role model the way that they want to see disability represented in science fiction and fantasy. And then they have a bunch of essays talking about it. And so that also gives like a broader view of many different people's perspectives, um, many different types of disability. Uh, so I think that those are also really good resources if you want to read more about disability in genre fiction. Now moving on to my DNFs, beginning with Rosewater by Tade Thompson. This is a book that I was buddy reading with Kristen at Kristen L. SFF Reader, who I will link below. Kristen is also a really great resource if you're at all interested in SFF. She reads so much of it. That's her primary reading. And she also is very reflective about her reading too. Um, and she keeps up with a lot of the new releases and she's very much following many of the different awards. So if you like SFF, definitely check her out. So we were trying to read Rosewater and I got 25% through it and then I just realized it wasn't for me. And this is not a bad book at all. I would not say to avoid it just because I didn't want to continue with it. Um, it has really, really cool world building. I mean, I was fascinated by the world building. It is 
this sort of near future-ish um, Lagos, Nigeria, and this dome thing appears, which is aliens basically, and there are some side effects from the aliens being there that kind of produce some different things, um, including some kind of psychic powers and stuff like that in some people. And we follow um, a main character who has developed some of these psychic abilities because of that. Uh, but the thing that didn't really work for me in this story, even though I thought the world building was fantastic, is that it's kind of a cyberpunk feel. And cyberpunk style stories are just not so much my thing. I like it when there's a twist on cyberpunk, um, especially if you're kind of changing up the genders or changing up what exactly it's doing. But this one fell into some of those very predictable tropes for cyberpunk with a very malcontent, disillusioned main character who isn't really um, very a good guy, but he's very talented and all the women want him and all these sorts of things. And it was just like not really the story that I wanted to read. And then it just had a couple of like really gruesome, gross scenes, as well as some very weird sex scenes that I just was not into. And I, I just realized that this is not going to be the book for me, but I would not discourage you from picking this book up if you want some really neat world building and you don't mind that kind of cyberpunk style of story. The next book that I DNF'd was Hints on Household Taste by Charles L. Eastlake. This is a nonfiction book that is sort of a modern reprinting of a book that was made in the Victorian era, talking about kind of how to do home decoration. Um, and we picked this up when we were on a vacation and went to a Victorian house museum and this was in the gift shop and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I finally picked it up and started reading it. The foreword, which is by kind of uh, a modern author talking about the importance of this book in that era, was really interesting. And then it got to the actual book and I could not stand the author. Um, Charles L. Eastlake is somebody who basically was so full of himself and so full of his idea of what the best um, kind of household taste was and he just started panning everybody else's taste. It was just so arrogant and so elitist and it got on my nerves incredibly quickly. So I DNF'd this at 8%. Um, I, even though I'm interested in some of the content that it might have and it is maybe kind of the book that defined Victorian home decor in that era, I just, I cannot stand the author. So I'm not gonna return to this one. Then I DNF'd Indian Legends of the Pacific Northwest by Ella E. Clark. This book actually wasn't bad. It's more just that I'm, I'm never going to finish it. Um, so actually, I DNF'd at 25%, but that 25% was read a couple of years ago. Sush had been reading this out loud to me, um, and it was kind of interesting, but we're just never going to return to it, and I don't really want to read it on my own. It's basically kind of an ethnography, actually. It was collected back in the 50s, where um, a woman went around and got all of these different oral traditions from different tribes um, in the Pacific Northwest and collated them. But what it means is that this isn't exactly a storybook to read. It's more of a, a history. It's a history of all of these oral traditions, which is very interesting in and of itself, but it's not very fun to read through because it's kind of each myth that is in here is like a paragraph long and you get, you know, 20 different myths from different tribes that are basically different variations on a theme and it feels kind of repetitive when you're reading through it. And even though we had read 25% of it, we just never wanted to pick this up and there's so many other books that we want to read together. So I just decided um, to kind of unhaul this one. So it's, it's sort of a DNF, sort of just an unhaul. And the last book that I decided to DNF is also basically an unhaul, and that is Philosophy for Beginners by Richard Osborne, illustrated by Ralph Edney. This is a book that I picked up at some book sale like 15 years ago, thinking, oh, I'd like to learn about philosophy, and then I never read it. Um, and I picked it up the other day to give it a try, and I did not like it. Um, this is basically an illustrated kind of graphic novel version of 
the history of philosophy, except this is not the history of philosophy. This is the history of Western philosophy. I looked at the table of contents and I was like, wait, why is it just Western? And it doesn't say Western. Um, and it's just, it's written by two white guys in the early nineties. And I just didn't like the tone of it. I didn't like the drawing style. And since I bought that book, I have also done stuff like watch the crash course series on the history of philosophy. I'll link that below because I I actually loved that session. I watched the entire thing and really, really enjoyed it. Um, and if you like shows like The Good Place, uh, it really is cool to watch that after having learned a lot about philosophy because there's so much philosophy in that series. Anyway, so I have already gone and done other things that teach me about philosophy. I don't really need this book anymore and I just didn't like the perspective and the drawing style. So I DNF'd it and I'm unhauling it. Okay, so that is everything that I read and DNF'd this week. If you guys have read any of these, if you have any thoughts, anything you wanna chat with me about, just leave me a comment down below.